The methods by which we'll accomplish those objectives include defining physical relationships, constraints, and these include things like friction head loss, generator, turbine efficiencies, discharge ratings, etc. And then to develop a model in Excel using VBA or Visual Basic for Applications to drive and enhance the computation of that Excel-based model. To calculate um, hourly outflows and generation based on current license operations that are represented in Riverware. Um, and then also look at proposed operation scenarios or hypothetical scenarios under different flow events. So ultimately that operations model, again, will be used to inform and set the boundary conditions of the upstream and downstream HECRAS models for each operations scenario considered. Is this mic working out? You guys hear okay? <laughs> can, can I just take it off the stand? Why not? I, there are tall people in this world. Get used to it. Okay, here we go. I have no idea what yeah. All right, so let's start out looking at the Army Corps of Engineers Riverware model. So this, this is a large um, geographic domain for this model, um, and it's a long time series. And the purpose of this model is for the Army Corps to be able to look at um, historical inflows throughout the system. And, and this is a large system. It encompasses Pensacola Dam, but it actually goes all the way down to Van Buren. So there's over 30 reservoirs represented in this model. And they're looking at this from a flood routing uh, perspective primarily. So they're, they're trying to look at, you know, given certain inflows at all these different locations, what are the rules that best manage the progression of the flood the decisions that are made to release uh, water from the various dams and try to manage you know the various objectives throughout the system the model runs on a daily time step and it's for a very long period of record going back to 1940 and then it goes up through 2017. methods used in this model include hydrologic routing and uh, that's different than what jesse just presented on with the hydraulic model where we're actually predicting water surface elevations this model uses hydrologic routing, so it's a little bit simpler version of moving the water through the system. In terms of flood control, there's various rule sets or constraints on the model. These include channel capacity, so making sure that we don't exceed you know, certain rated channel capacities at different points in the system. Ramping rates, which are how quickly the water discharge from a dam is increased or decreased over time. So trying not to increase or decrease too quickly. Balance levels throughout the system. So each reservoir is assigned a balance level, and these balance levels are used as part of the model's decision making to try to evenly distribute the storage capacity throughout the various flood control reservoirs in the system. Um, so it's, it's tied to a storage value, but it's not a linear relationship. So for different values of storage, that'll equate to a different balance level um, so it's just a way of kind of bringing everything into a common equation set that it can use to balance the relative amount of storage available. And then the main control point driving a lot of the decision making in the model is that point downstream at the Van Buren gauge. There are also conservation and power generation rules applied to the model. Uh, but primarily what we're what we're looking at when we look to this model is we're looking for the hydrologic routing, the historical inflow events, and the flood control rules. So the next thing I want to talk about is this flood routing model. And what this is, is essentially a bridge between the period of record riverware model and the operations model that will be used in the study. So the flood routing model looks at a geographic subset of the Army Corps of Engineers Riverware model. So instead of um, you know, concerning ourselves with the, the entire basin and all the decision making that's going on there, we're focusing in for this study purposes on Pensacola Dam, Grand Lake, and then also Lake Hudson and Fort Gibson, because these three reservoirs operate as a subsystem 
in the river or model. Um, so we're looking at those three reservoirs together and creating a separate model from the river or model, but it's going to be driven and fed by a lot of the same information that's in riverware. So the, for this flood routing model, we can also look all the way back to 1940 up through 2017, so same time frame as the riverware model itself. It will also use a daily time step similar to riverware. The three reservoirs I mentioned are the geographic limitations of this model. And we're going to use the same hydrologic routing parameters that are in riverware and a lot of the same flood control rules that are in riverware. So looking at channel capacity, ramping rates and balance levels and using the same types of decision making methods, the same types of calculation methods that are used in riverware, we're going to replicate those in this flood routing model. The one notable exception here is we don't have that main control point at Van Buren in the flood routing model. That's outside the, the physical domain of the study. So that's not going to be part of the model. And that, is, that is a limitation in terms of trying to replicate what Riverware is doing. But the other flood control rules can be pretty faithfully um, simulated to give very similar uh, results to what we see in Riverware. Importantly, we're not looking at the, um, the conservation rules or the power generation rules from Riverware. When we make this jump to the flood routing model, the main purpose is to look at the way floods are routed through the system using those same types of decision making logic that are in Riverware. Um, so the you know, conservation rules are just, they're not really a factor when it comes to looking at floods as much, so they're just not real significant for the purposes of the study. And the, the hydropower generation rules, we're going to replace with our own more nuanced set of generation rules that reflect better what GRDA actually does in managing its hydropower system. So this flood routing model that I'm talking about is actually going to be built in Microsoft Excel, driven by VBA code. And so that's just an easy way that we can you know, take all these rules and put them together and combine them to get this geographic subset with very similar types of flood routing logic. So the operations model then for this study is going to look at Pensacola Dam and, and Lake Hudson, so two reservoirs. Um, so Fort Gibson was included again in the flood routing model because that's part of that subsystem. But for the study purposes, what we're really concerned about is Grand Lake and Lake Hudson. The operations model is going to look at a time frame starting in 2004 and going through 2017. And the reason that we're starting in 2004 is because this model is going to use an hourly time step and hourly data is only available starting in 2004 to drive that hourly computation. The methods that we're going to use include the same hydrologic routing parameters that were used in the river model and the flood, flood routing model. Um, and the, the flood control rules that are used in the flood routing model, those flood control decisions are going to be passed into the operations model to help drive the decision making within the operations model. The key differentiator here is that we're going to have the ability to do more detailed hydropower system modeling within this model. So, um, you know, more nuanced things that GRDA actually does when it's marketing its power are going to be easier to represent on an hourly time step than they would be on a daily time step. So it's important that we get down and do a little bit more detail with this model so we can represent that more accurately. And again, this model will be based in Microsoft Excel, driven by VBA code. And that, that just gives us the ability to, to really make it whatever it needs to be for the purposes of the study. And um, it's also, I think, a very accessible uh, thing that a lot of people have access to look at. Okay, so this slide, just to kind of wrap up and clarify everything I've discussed so far, is going to show the flow of information through these three distinct models. So starting with the riverware model um, containing hydrology, both inflows and also routing information, flood control rules, and conservation hydropower rules. Again, not considering the hydropower rules from riverware, we're going to take the other two main components and, and pass those into this geographic subset that we're calling the daily flood routing model. The results of that daily flood routing model will be passed into the operations model, which will then also take in 
information about power optimization and reservoir management. And when we talk about reservoir management, we're talking about elevations on Grand Lake below 745 PD. Uh, above 745, obviously, then the Army Corps has jurisdiction to dictate uh, the flood routing decisions. And that's what's represented in Riverware you know, in being packs, passed through the, the flood routing model. The output of the operations model then will be hourly hydrographs for that 2004 to 2017 event, for example, or period of record, I should say. And those, those reservoir stage and discharge hydrographs are then what can be passed into the HECRAS model to set those boundary conditions for both the upstream and the downstream hydraulic models. So when we're talking about you know, calibration of the hydraulic model like Jesse went through this morning, we have historical data that can drive that. But when we jump to hypothetical events, whether that's hypothetical inflows or hypothetical operating scenarios, you know, we need another tool that can provide those inputs to the hydraulic model because there is no historical record of that. It's a, they're hypothetical. So that's what this tool is for. It's to develop, you know, a tool that's based in the riverware model that mimics what riverware is doing to the extent that we can and then passing you know, that uh, modified for these hypothetical events into the hydraulic models. The other output of the operations model obviously is the power generation result. So we're here today to talk about data inputs for the operations model. And first, I'll go through the inputs that are available from Riverware. So we have two types. We have time series data and rating tables. In terms of time series data, the Riverware model has uh, river discharge, local reservoir inflow. So that would be smaller tributaries that don't have their own uh, node within the model or direct rainfall in the reservoirs. Um, that all gets lumped together, so that's local inflow and then also evaporation and seepage at the reservoirs. The rating table information available from Riverware includes the elevation storage area curves at each reservoir. And those, you know, Jesse uh, took us through some detail about the bathymetric surveys and, you know, the information we have um, at Grand Lake and upstream. So Riverware has its own representation of what the elevation versus storage versus area is on each reservoir. So the operating level versus storage. So as I mentioned, the operating balance levels are something that the model uses to try and <laughs> distribute the available storage throughout the system. So that, that operating balance level is related to uh, different storage levels in each reservoir. Maximum regulated spill would be the maximum amount of discharge that could be released from the spillway, for example, with all the spillway gates fully opened. So there's a rating curve of elevation versus maximum regulated spill. There's also a separate rating curve for elevation versus induced surcharge, which is the amount of water that's going to overtop, even if you don't open any gates, it's just going over either ungated spillways or going over the top of structures, for example, with the gates closed, that's what induced surcharge is. Um, seasonal reservoir elevation tables, so for Pensacola, there is this uh, target elevation that varies seasonally. Uh, that's represented with a table within the river or model. And then the hydrologic routing coefficients for each separate routing reach, those are represented as tables within the model. So this is all data that we can extract out of riverware and, and use to feed into the flood routing model and then into the operations model. So for the operations model itself, there's also some separate input data that didn't come from Riverware, but is available from other sources. Um, so obviously the flood routing model that we're developing, that is going to be an input to the operations model. And then other time series data. So these will include things like electricity prices. So we have hourly electricity prices, both for the day ahead market, real time market. Um, and then we also have information about unit outages. So if a particular turbine was out for maintenance or some other, other type of outage. We have historical data about when that occurred. 
At Pensacola, there are air valves on the turbines that can be used to provide enhanced dissolved oxygen downstream. So when those air valves are, are open, um, we have a record of uh, information about the operation. Um, well, it's really a yeah, record of the dissolved oxygen levels and then information about when those valves might be used. And then other rating tables, yeah, things like turbine head loss, uh, rating relationship, um, the maximum allowable discharge through the turbines to avoid cavitation or other kind of um, hazardous operation conditions and the efficiency of the turbines. We have the newer elevation versus storage and area information on the reservoirs that Jesse went through this morning. Um, we have the tailwater rate rating relationship below Grand Lake and Lake Hudson. And we have the spillway capacity um, where we know, you know, for a given gate opening, um, how much discharge you can expect. All right, so we have riverward model, we have the flood routing model, the operations model. Talked about the types of input data that we have available from different sources. Now looking forward, when we get this model fully developed and we're going to the step of validating it against the river or model output, how do we go through that process? So first of all, there are two parameters that are really available that are common between the operations model and the river or model, and that would be the total discharge from each dam and the elevation at each reservoir. So for total discharge, we would be looking at the hourly total discharge from the operations model, averaging that over a 24 hour period and comparing that to the corresponding daily value from the river or model output. For elevations, we're looking at the end of day or midnight headwater level in each reservoir, comparing that to the corresponding end of day value from the river or model. The date range available for validation for the flood routing model would be all the way back from 1940 up through 2017. So we can essentially replicate that entire period of record. And then for the operations model, again, the hourly data that we need to drive that model is only available starting in April 1st, 2004. So we can take it from then up through the end of 2017. Uh, two different metrics will be used to look at the goodness of fit between the riverware model output versus the operations or flood routing model output. So these correlations can be measured using the R squared value or the coefficient of determination. And then also the NSC or the Nash Cycliff efficiency. Very similar parameters. Um, and it, you can read the details here, but essentially the main difference is that the R squared value is just looking for the, the goodness of that correlation, but it doesn't really tell you anything about the, um, the slope of the line between those correlations. So if your model is over predicting or under predicting at higher or lower ends of the variable range, that won't be represented. Um, but the NSC actually does capture that. So the NSC is looking for both correlation and the, the fit along that one to one slope line that you would want to see if your model is doing a perfect job of, of matching. So the top of this slide just summarizes the, the range of values um, for each parameter, um, for each metric rather. And then the bottom is um, what we would consider um, you know, accepted values for the goodness of fit of these two different metrics. So um, whether we have a satisfactory or a good or a very good correlation, it's a, it's a little bit different in terms of what values you're looking for between these two different metrics. So to wrap up, um, we have two different models that we're working on. The flood routing model is going to simulate the river wear, daily flood routing decisions for that three reservoir subsystem surrounding our study area. The operations model will simulate hourly hydropower scheduling and seek to maintain those flood routing decisions from, that are passed from the flood routing model. And then model validation will be done to compare our model output to the river or model output using R squared and NSE and measuring correlation to total discharge and elevation. 
that's all I have for a presentation. Are there any questions? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm hearing a little, having a little bit of trouble hearing you. The question is, how do you, how do you deal with outliers? Both of these calculation methods struggle when outliers are, are put into the equation. So how, how do you, how do you affect that? That's a good question. So the, sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback in the room. Um, the question was, how do you deal with outliers? Both of these. Um, validation metrics are sensitive to extreme outlier values. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, right, so yeah, the weather can change on a dime. You can get extreme events, lots of precipitation in 10 minutes, and it could throw an outlier. Yeah, so there, there's a difference here between um, looking at real weather data, uh, such as the example that you mentioned, versus, you know, keeping in mind what we're doing is we're validating to this river wear period of record model. Um, so, you know, that's that's what we're tasked with. That's what's in the study plan. So we, we need to, to validate to that model. That model runs on a daily time step. So in your example, you know, an extreme 10 minute burst of rainfall you know, that may not show up in the daily riverware model the same way that you would see it in a rain gauge. So, yeah, we, I think we have to recognize the limitations of the daily time step that's in the riverware model. Um, but keeping in mind, you know, the operations model will be computing on an hourly time step. Um, so, you know, maybe there's some potential to capture a little bit more resolution there, but um, it, to, to, to the first part of your question, how do we handle extreme values? I mean, Again, we're, we're modeling a model in a sense. We're, we're validating against another model here. So those extreme outliers would have to be driven by high flows coming into the river model, for example. And then you've got a high flow event at some station. Well, we're going to be looking at that same inflow information in our flood routing model. It's going to pull that same data in from riverware to drive our flood routing model. And so then if we see a high peak within the flood routing model that lines up with the high peak in the river or model, we've done our job. We've validated. We've, we've compared well. Is that okay? Hey, so this is David Williams. I just want to make a couple of comments about the river or model. Um, it is a tremendously useful tool that we use. We don't use it in a real time setting, it's a studies model. Um, but a couple of things to know about it. Um, uses an idealized rule set. And what that means is, during an actual flood, sometimes we will go and request a deviation for a particular reservoir and actually hold more water than, than is um, called for in the uh, operation within the water program. We have to go and do that. Um, but you just need to know that um, that happens sometimes. So you'll see differences between riverware simulation and actual operation. A lot of times, because we deviate, and we have reasons for doing so, and for doing so, but that exists. Another point I wanted to make is that um, you didn't mention the new surcharge, which is important in a lot of these reservoirs. Um, Port Gibson is a little bit unique. It's a technical operation. Normally, we wouldn't have surcharge at, at a pool like that. However, Port Gibson is not authorized for the new surcharge. So we don't do surcharge. In other words, we don't hold a higher pool at Port Gibson because that project is not um, authorized to do so. So those are just some things to keep in mind with the wear. And one last point I'm going to make, actually I think it'll be pretty record for 2020. So if that's something that you want to include, just uh, uh, get with me after the fact and we'll be sure you have the most of today, please. Thank you. So just uh, for, the, for the meeting participants online, David Williams of the Army Corps just provided some additional information. Um, I think, number one, I'll start at the end and work backwards. The period of record model has been extended through the end of 2020, so that information is now available. Uh, so taking a note of that, and, and we can coordinate with the Army Corps about that. And then also, um, 
Fort Gibson, even though there is an induced surcharge curve in the model, it's not actually authorized for that operating condition um, noted. And then uh, working backwards, just the fact that the period of record model is an analysis tool, it's a studies tool, and it may not always represent the real world operations made in real time. You know, it's a starting point. And then the Army Corps has that authority to make decisions about, you know, holding water, releasing water from specific points in the system in real time in order to finesse and fine tune uh, the results that are coming out of riverware to achieve a better overall result in real time. Is that more or less? Okay. Good. Thank you for those inputs. So we have a question in the room here um, about who, who approves the deviations at the, at the Army Corps. So two part question, so the deviations themselves, so it depends on what the deviation is. The minor deviation can be approved at the district level. The larger deviation has to go to the southwestern division and really large deviations have to go so they're a process to request and receive How that is communicated. So during a flood event, um, our district is in constant communication with the local emergency manager. And anytime we are changing our releases or deviating from the um, water control manual, we certainly do make every effort to communicate that with the officials. And so um, you know, there, there are some emergency managers in the room. Um, that is something that gets communicated directly to emergency managers during a real time. How much does the issue of Fort Gibson, that level issue, how much does that play into our problems? It's not resulting in an upstream issue with respect to gifts. And what happens with deviations? Uh, can you speak up? This, is yes, sir. Case? Can you hear me up there? Okay, I'll speak loud. If um, as as you guys speak loud, the folks on the team are saying that they can hear it in their system. They don't have to hear it. Okay, so what happens during the flood? There are two really two different types of floods. What I would term a, a routine flood, you have a lot of those. Uh, and that involves system balance. So you, you mentioned Van Buren, and we have a control point at Van Buren. Stage 22 feet is the control stage, the regulated stage. However, in a huge flood, let's take 2019 as an example, it's no longer a system operation. It's an individual project operation. It's a dam safety issue because the, those dams are designed to hold a certain amount of water, only authorized to hold to a certain stage behind the dam. And so with Fort Gibson not having surcharge, what the, the effect is really downstream because where we could be holding that surcharge at Fort Gibson, we pass that water on. Surcharge, so there are different types of, of dams. But a lot of the dams around here have these concave, convex uh, shaped gates that you've seen called tinker gates. And um, a benefit of the tinker gate is as you raise them out of the water, you actually gain an additional amount of pool behind them. Now that doesn't mean you're not releasing water. You have a big release coming out as you're, release, as you're raising those gates. But the catch is you can't let the gates become submerged because they become inoperable when submerged. So you have to keep them out of the water. But as you start to raise them, you actually, for some of the reservoirs, gain um, some additional storage in terms of one, two, feet or so behind the gates. This is Dan Sullivan, GRDA. Is it one of the really key points to all of this is that the study that we're doing, requested by FERC, uh, looks at the, the lakes and waters under the GRDA system 
but it is managed as part of a larger system that may or may not be impacted by flooding on the Arkansas River, on the Cimarron, on any of the other rivers that ultimately flow into the river. Yes, yeah, so um, the TRDA projects are part of a 30, 30 flood control reservoir system in Arkansas, Oklahoma, above Van Buren. And so when we're in a flood control operation, we certainly are operating as part of that entire system. Yeah, other questions or comments on the operations model? Do I want to take a break or do you want to keep going? Okay, right, let's take 10 minutes and then we'll do the downstream model. All right, we're going to take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and discuss the downstream model. Thank you. 
Okay, we're coming back together in the room. And this is Ryan Greif again. I'm going to pick up by answering a few of the questions that came in on the chat, and then I'll turn it over to Nick Hathaway to discuss the downstream hydraulic model. 
right, so the first question we had come in from Navri. It says, apologies if this was already clarified, but what is the operating range of reservoir elevations that will be evaluated by the model? It's a good question, Navri. Um, it's pretty well laid out in the study plan documents, um, but essentially it was suggested that GRDA look at elevations in Pensacola Dam starting at 734 and going up to 760 on Pensacola datum. Um, and so that's, you know, that's what's in the study plan. So that's what we're going to be uh, looking at as we progress forward. The model itself, I would, I would just add, is again reflective of what's in Riverware. Um, so yeah. the, the full range of uh, rating tables that are in Riverware are also going to be available to our model. Next question from Brad Vickers. Uh, just wondering why Riverware wasn't used for both the flood routing and operations models. Another excellent question. Um, so I guess two, two main points uh, that I would offer as to why that wasn't used. Uh, number one, uh, we looked at the capabilities for Riverware to be used to model everything that we need to look at in the study. And one of the limitations that we found early on was getting into the detailed representation of the actual hydropower operations, the way that GRDA runs its facilities, was going to be difficult in Riverware because there weren't a lot of rules um, built in to handle many of the nuances that we need to look at. So they could be built in, but it would require some custom programming. Um, and the language that's used for that programming is just a little bit less common than something like Excel and VBA. So that was an early on decision in the study process to say, all right, we're going to use this tool, Excel, VBA, it's very commonly available. Uh, a lot of people know that programming language, so it's just a lot um, more adaptable for us. The second reason, which is probably the primary reason, um, is that the river model, again, is set up for this period of record simulation using daily time steps. And that's just really not um, suitable for what we need to look at with the hydropower operations for this study. So we're, we're using something where we can easily get down to the level of looking at hourly operations. Okay, another question from Brad. The report cites the 1980 Arkansas River Master Control Manual, but the rules of a taper have changed 2007. Are they using the 2007 rules? So, yeah, my understanding is that um, taper is a specific application that can be used for more um, short time frame uh, forecasts uh, to help the core understand um, you know, for, for a real-time event that's unfolding, um, what different operating strategies might yield throughout the system. And then they can, again, refine on that and make adjustments as needed. Um, so taper and riverware, very similar underlying rules. The specific dates and the specific rule sets involved, you know, I'll, I'll probably have to defer to the core. What I can say is that uh, the core of engineers delivered to us the period of record riverware model through 2017 and, and that's the rule set that we're incorporating into our study. So if there have been changes in the uh, aforementioned um, extension through 2020, you know, that's something that we can look at. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about the taper model itself in terms of its applicability to the study. Uh, you know, again, we're tasked with validating to the Riverware period of record model. So if there are helpful portions of taper, we can talk about that. But at the end of the day, we're validating against the period of record model, not the paper itself. Okay, and the next question, um, also from Brad, we're using electrical prices 2004 onward. The industry has changed dramatically in the last few years with wind being one of the major factors in pricing. Is going back to 2004 useful? So that's a good question. That's certainly something that we've thought a lot about. Um, anytime that you're licensing a project, you know, for a vast amount of time in the future, there's always going to be uncertainty in the electrical market and, and what could transpire going forward. Um, so, you, you know, we're obviously thinking about that, considering um, how best to represent not just what happens today, but, you know, 
um, thinking about what could happen in the future. You know, GRDA is, is really um, very well versed in this subject. This is what they do, uh, this is their business. So, you know, Mead and Hunt and GRDA are working very closely together. We'll continue to work closely together to consider questions like this. You know, what, what period of time should we be thinking about? What's the best way to represent electrical prices for the purposes of this study? Um, so th thanks for the input, Brad. Um, that is something that we're thinking about. Okay, and then just another final comment, not really a question, but Brad says Riverware was designed as an operations modeling system. Okay, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Nick. All right, thanks, Ryan. I'm Nick Hathaway. I work with both Ryan and Jesse. I'm also a water resources engineer with Mead Hunt. Um, here today to talk about the downstream hydraulic model. So just to recap, um, Jesse talked about the upstream hydraulic model and let's say upstream, upstream of Pensacola Dam. And then um, Ryan talked about the operations model that we'll ultimately be using to model synthetic or hypothetical events that we can then feed into our hydraulic models for boundary conditions. So I'll be talking about the downstream hydraulic model and that would be downstream of Pensacola Dam through Lake Hudson to just downstream of Kerr Dam. So with that, we'll get going. Uh, just a quick quick outline here. We're gonna go through some intro and background stuff that Jesse's a lot of it, he's already covered, so we'll breeze through that pretty quickly. We'll get into the model development and then wrap it up with model calibration. So a quick intro and background. Uh, you can see here uh, a map of our study area for the downstream hydraulic model. This figure is very similar to the one Jesse showed for the upstream model, only this is for the downstream hydraulic model. Um, you can see here labeled on the map, uh, you can see Kerr Dam, which is the downstream end of Lake Hudson toward the bottom of the map, and then Pensacola Dam, which is at the downstream end of Grand Lake um, near the, ups, uh, the upper part of the map there. I also want to point out the Salina Pump Storage Project, which is near the downstream end of, Grand, of Lake Hudson um, within our model domain, so we'll be talking a little bit about that later. Um, you'll also see the relevant USGS gauges that we'll be talking about throughout my presentation on this map as well. I'm not going to list them all off because we'll do that later. Um, and just a couple more things to point out. Um, the pink lines on this um, map are the 1D model cross sections. This is a 1D hydraulic model. Um, and the orange shaded areas are what we call storage areas in this one dimensional hydraulic model. And I'll be talking about that as well. So. The basic gist from this map is that our model extends go from just downstream of Pensacola Dam to just downstream of Kerr Dam. So it goes through Neosho River and essentially Lake Hudson. Jesse already talked about the relicensing timeline, so I'm not going to really go into that much in much detail here. But um, the one thing, one takeaway here is that FERC's recommendation was that we hold a conference call, which is what you're here for today, to discuss the hydraulic model inputs, and in this case, the downstream hydraulic inputs and calibration. Jesse talked about vertical datums. It's the same story here. We have several vertical datums used in the area, NABD88, NGBD29, and Pensacola datum, similar to the upstream model. The model was developed in NGBD29 vertical datum. Uh, everything I'm reporting here today is in the Pensacola or PD datum for consistency. So now I'll get into the more the nitty gritty of the actual model development itself. As I mentioned before, this is a one dimensional or 1D unsteady state HECRAS model. Similar to the upstream model, we're using the latest full release of HECRAS, which is version 5.0.7. I'm not gonna go into the details about the beta releases that Jesse already talked about earlier. Um, as I already mentioned, our model extends extent from the downstream end, which is just downstream of Kerr Dam at River Mile 47.86 to the upstream extent of the model, which is just downstream of Pensacola Dam, approximately river mile 76.88. Similar to Jesse's discussion, um, it's the same story for the um, downstream model. We need topographic and bathymetric data inputs to the model that essentially represent the topography and or the bottom of the reservoir or river that we're trying to model. This represents the physical land that's out there that we're trying to represent in the model. 
So in this map here, you can see it only two different data sources we use to, to develop our um, topo and bathymetric data. Uh, the first being the USGS National Elevation Data Set, or NED, third arc second DEM. That's the hatched area on this map. Um, and then the pink area on this map is the OWRB bathymetric survey that was done in 2008. So that is used to represent the bottom of the Neosho River and the bottom of Lake Hudson. So those two data sets were combined to create a single, essentially, terrain surface that we developed our model from. Getting to some more specifics about the 1D model geometry. Um, as I mentioned before, this model uses one-dimensional or 1D cross-sections. And we're using those to represent the Neosho River Channel and Lake Hudson itself. Uh, as seen in this image here on the left, we're using some parallel reaches to represent the Neosho River Channel and the main spillway channel just downstream of Pensacola Dam before those two channels converge just a short distance downstream. And then also, as I touched on earlier, we're using uh, storage areas in this model to represent uh, the available storage in the what I'll call offline uh, tributary areas outside of the main flow path of the river or reservoir. Um, as I'll get to, volume is a very important uh, component of this model in particular, since our model domain is really just essentially the reservoir and the reservoir being Lake Hudson itself. So we needed to make sure we were accounting for the volume as accurately as possible in a one dimensional form. And that would be using the storage areas in com combination with these 1D cross sections. Uh, we also used the storage area, as you can see on this map, um, kind of bridging the distance between the main spillway channel and the main river channel downstream of Pensacola Dam to allow flow to exchange between those two channels if it were to ever get that high. Just like the upstream model, there are bridges in this model. Uh, there are four of them that cross Lake Hudson and the Neosha River in the model domain. Uh, we defined all those bridges from scratch using available record drawings from Oklahoma Department of Transportation and GRDA. Kerr Dam is also represented in the model, and this time it's represented as an inline structure with a flow hydrograph boundary condition defined at that uh, structure for calibration purposes. And I'll get into that and why it's important. So you can see here on this, this page just a, a graphic of one of the bridges and what it looks like in the HECRAS model. Similar to the upstream model, we have to talk about roughness coefficients or Manning's ends. Um, prior to calibration, we needed to come up with the base end values to use before those values were tweaked. Um, it's a similar story. We needed to essentially delineate the different land covers based on aerial photography and then assign n values to them to then assign to the one dimensional hypergraph model. So um, you can see them listed here ranging from a channel or a reservoir bottom, uh, Manning's end value of 0 0.03, all the way up to a medium to dense brush of 0 0.1 for the Manning's end values. And again, this is prior to calibration. So these values were tweaked um, following calibration. And I should also note that we use guidance from the HECRAS hydraulic reference manual for establishing uh, these values. Yeah, go ahead. Well, let's get a mic to you first. Bernie says he might ask this earlier, but I'm not following you. You don't also usually enter value information in your. Can you speak up a little bit? I think it's hard to Yeah, can you use the meander? I mean, do you use meandering as a value in your calculation? So the end value is also something that. That should be when, when rivers go back and forth. That's also something that affects your flow. Um, it, it, it could be incorporated into a Manning's end value, but in this case, it is not. Um, Jesse, do you have a better input on that? <laughs> uh, so, two items on that uh, topic. Um, one, you know, for now, Nick is talking about the base and values. Prior to calibration, um, actually, I think I have three things to say. So that's one. Number two, if you are doing a calibration, because we typically lump a lot of energy loss sources into Manning's end, that's going to come out in the calibration regardless of the source, whether it's from meander, whether it's from dense vegetation. Um, and then furthermore, and the reason I'm jumping up here and stepping on Nick's toes is that I know from the upstream model, in Tetratech study, 
the reason that we adopted their Mannings, their base Mannings and values is they did that exact, the classic procedure of you take a base base Mannings and value, and then you add in effects of sinuosity, you add in effects of vegetation, et cetera, right? I, um, I forget the exact publication, but it's, it's the one we, we all use on a regular basis, right? So you have a, like a core and value, you have your factors, right? It's like N1, N2, N3, N4, and then you multiply it by your M value, and then you come up with your predicted um, N value. And that would be what we would all use if we did not have any data for calibration, right? We often have to build models where we have zero data whatsoever for calibration. And so we make a, that's our best estimate of Manning's N values. So now that I've said all that, you know, to directly answer the question about did we consider sinuosity of the river with this? Yes, Nick and I are both considering sinuosity in the sense that we have measured data that we are calibrating to. So the effect of sinuosity is coming out, you know, coming out in the wash, so to speak, when we get to the finalized end value. That's an excellent question, though. Thank you. And, and sinuosity is really not an issue for this model domain. It's very much a reservoir. So, yep, great point, though. Yeah, thanks. And that was Brian Estep, right, that answered the question? Oops, right direction. So the other main input to the model is what we call unsteady flow data. I have to move the mic up because Jess is a little short. Um, <laughs> so um, when I talk about unsteady flow data, this is the flow data that is essentially feeding flow into the model and the associated boundary conditions with that. So how is the, wa how is the water routed through the system according to boundary conditions and how it's being fed into the, the, the model domain? Um, in this case, we had inflow boundary conditions represented from uh, USGS gauges that are listed here. They are the Neosho River near Langley, Big Cabin Creek uh, near, at, near Big Cabin, Spavanaugh Creek, and then Spavanaugh Lake. Now, I will mention that the Neosho River gauge near Langley was used primarily for calibration purposes using the stages at that gauge. So not necessarily inflow boundary condition, but it's still a very relevant gauge for the study. Uh, we also use inflow hydrographs to represent outflows from Pensacola Dam itself. Um, so those data sets came from GRDA, um, and that data is usually summarized by GRDA and sent on to the core, and we utilize that data for our inflow boundary conditions at the dam there. Uh, we also had inflow boundary condition for the East Spillway. Um, that was a lateral inflow hydrograph to represent flows from that structure, and that's at Pensacola Dam as well. We also have, uh, as another in unsteady flow data input, uh, what's called a lateral inflow hydrograph. Uh, these are what they sound like. They are lateral flows coming into the model domain, so from the tributaries into the reservoir laterally. Uh, we have two that it came from USGS gauges. Uh, those are Big Cabin Creek and Lake Spavina, and we transferred those gauges, the gauge data, to the model domain um, using some, some transfers for that. And then uh, we also have the Salina Pump Storage Project, which I briefly mentioned earlier, uh, that's near the lower end of, of Lake Hudson. So this needs to be represented in the model for calibration because we need, a, we need all the volume we can account for, we, we, we want to account for when we try to calibrate. So we accounted for a Salina Pump Storage Project using um, flows that were derived from power consumption and generation data that we got from GRDA. So as what we did is we converted the megawatts to a discharge essentially in CFS um, for both generating and pumping modes using different conversion factors for each. So in this case for Salina pump storage, um, a positive flow represents inflows due to generating. So water is coming from the upper reservoir into Lake Hudson through generating. Uh, negative flows at this boundary condition represent withdrawals due to pumping up to the upper reservoir at Salina. Um, so that's, that's how that was uh, in, captured in the model. Um, we also, as I mentioned earlier, represented outflows from Kerr Dam um, using GRDA and Corps of Engineers time series data. Again, we're routing flows through the reservoir using a, downs, a boundary condition at the dam of flows, not stages. Um, that's important to note because when I discuss calibration, I'll get into why that's important. 
Um, we also used a normal depth boundary condition at the downstream end of the model. So the downstream end of the model is just downstream of Kerr Dam. Um, using this normal depth boundary condition effect doesn't have any effect on the Lake Hudson elevations, um, but it's needed in the model for the model to run and work properly. So that's an important thing because the dam is between the boundary condition and the reservoir that we're concerned with, which is Lake Hudson. Um, so it's important to mention. Next, we'll get into model calibration. Is there any, I guess I can stop here. Is there any questions before I get going? Um, this model was much different than the upstream model for calibration. These are two different animals. As I mentioned probably several times now, this is very much a reservoir in our model domain and not so much a riverine system. Yes, there is a riverine system toward the upper end as you get to, towards Pensacola, but it's very much driven by the water surface elevations at Kerr Dam. Um, so we held, we, instead, rather than holding the pool elevation at Kerr Dam to what was observed during these events, we put an outflow hydrograph boundary condition or an outflow hydrograph at the dam. So we're routing the flows through that dam instead of holding water surfaces um, at the dam. And now this is important because being such a reservoir driven system, the point we're calibrating to, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, is the Langley stream gauge, which is very much influenced by the, the reservoir elevations at Kerr Dam. So if we were just to hold the elevations at Kerr Dam to what was observed, we'd be getting a very tight fit for calibration because they're very, very dependent on each other. So we wanted to route flows properly through the reservoir using that flow hydrograph. So we modeled with four different calibration events that you can see here. Those are the June 2007 event, the April 2008 event, April 2011 event, and the May 2015 event. These were chosen because they are higher flow events, but they do throughout the event represent a range of flows. It's not just a single high flow. Um, and we, they were chosen because there was good data available. We, we couldn't sacrifice using uh, essentially bad data um, there were some events we reviewed that um, there, there was a lot of mismatch between the data that we couldn't reconcile from a volume standpoint. So bad data in equals bad data out when it comes to modeling, especially when you're calibrating. So we needed to make sure we had very solid um, input data that we could use for calibration, which it did limit the events we could use for calibrating for this model. And as I mentioned before, we are calibrating to stages at the Langley stream gauge. Um, so that's the one point of calibration when we get into calibrating the roughness values. So as I mentioned before, volume is important in this model domain. Um, our initial model runs unsurprisingly showed some discrepancies between the modeled elevations at Kerr Dam and what was observed. And this can be expected because there are um, numerous ungauged tributaries to Lake Hudson, some of them fairly large. So with this missing volume, you can't necessarily route your volumes through the system if something's missing from that equation. So um, we were getting the wavering uh, stages at Kerr Dam due to this missing volume. Um, our solution to this was to apply what's called a uniform lateral inflow hydrograph to the, the um, Lake Hudson portion of the model. So this essentially spreads flow, a flow that we define um, along the reservoir to make up for this missing volume that is very likely due to the ungauged um, channels or the un ungauged reaches coming in. So for each of our calibration events, we it computed this lateral inflow hydrograph for each one specifically through an iterative process. And the goal here was to minimize the differences between the modeled and the observed water surface elevations at Kerr Dam. So that was kind of step one of calibration, because if you don't have elevations at Kerr Dam matching appropriately with the flows that are modeling out of it, you can't expect a good, solid, comfortable calibration when you get into the roughness coefficients. So with the volume equation or the volume question kind of taken care of, then we're able to tweak the Manning's end values to match the modeled stages and the observed stages at the Langley stream gauge. The goal here, similar to the upstream model, was to have a to match the observed water surface elevations at the gauge um, using a single model geometry. Um, in this time, we were away, we were able to get away with that by only increasing the Manning's end values across the board by eight percent 
which isn't a huge increase, but it's an increase nonetheless. And you can see those uh, increased values here on this slide. Um, again, this, the values I showed you before only increased by 8%. And the results are that we get a very good match between the computed and modeled stages at the Langley gauge, um, not only the peak stages that were observed, but throughout the entire event. Um, that's an important note, and I'll show some graphs here in a second to show that. Um, this table here shows the, the observed versus the modeled peak water surface elevation, so that's an instant in time at the peak of the event um, at the Langley stream gauge between the modeled and observed. Uh, you can see a very good fit between these numbers. Actually, the biggest difference we see is for the June 2007 event, and that's only about three tenths of a foot. So pretty solid match there um, for calibration there. As I mentioned before, we had uh, a very good fit throughout the events, um, not just a moment in time, but throughout the event for the, the, the fit of our calibrated model. Um, the orange line on this graph, and this is the June 2007 event, um, the orange line represents the uncalibrated model run, and that would be the run before the volume discrepancy was resolved. So that would explain why it was so far off. Um, the gray line is the observed values, the gray dotted line that is, and then the blue line is the calibrated model um, results. Uh, you can see it, essentially a very good fit between the blue and the dashed gray lines, which is what the goal of the calibration was. Um, so I think we were successful there. It's a similar story. This is the April 2008 event, again, showing a very good fit between the ultimate calibrated model and the observed um, stages at the gauge. Similar story for April 2011. I think you'll probably see the trend. And then finally, for the May 2015, um, a pretty good fit throughout the event between the modeled and calibrated stages. And that's it. Um, any questions before I am done? I'm not seeing anything on the chat either, so nothing in the room. Okay, Brian, take it over. Yeah. So I uh, wanted to go around one last time for any comments or questions on anything we've covered today that hasn't had a chance to uh, be asked yet. Chief, so in lieu of all the data that's been presented, is there an impact on operating? What's how is there So today's meeting was for the calibration on the models that are going to be used to inform really all of the other studies that are underway. Almost every one of them has some component from the H and H study that we have. And so this is we're going forward from there, so we will have a lot of information to present at the ISR meeting in the first part of October. Did we catch anything on the chat? All right, so we do look forward to seeing everybody in October. Uh, we'll be getting that information out. We've got a tentative date set. As soon as we finalize that, we'll send that out. Uh, we can meet you all to RSVP when you get that, so we can make sure we get the proper size venue for that. I do appreciate the people on the phone uh, helping, bearing with us on the te technological challenges that we had. But as you can see, we have a lot of information. We're going to have a lot more information in October. And so hopefully we'll all be together in person then, because I think it will make the meeting go a lot easier. So thanks again for taking your whole day to uh, spend with us and uh, see the work that we've done so far and we look forward to seeing everybody in October. So thank you very much.